I want to welcome everybody here to come to these uh, Sunday afternoon talks for reflection, contemplation, to reiterate the the Buddhist approach is to stimulate or to awaken the mind rather than to to condition it. So, so this is, I think, one reason why, one of the main reasons why Buddhism is uh, uh, an attractive uh, religion at this time in the Western world because we no longer uh, want to be told things. We want, we want to. Uh, be awakened. We have the. We begin to realize we have the ability to to know in a in a way in a more direct way than just through the grasping of somebody else's ideas or somebody else's views and words. <clears throat> so I get this note about Venerable Nanda Maitreya, who would passed away uh, on the 18th of July. 102 years old, and uh, last time I saw him, I asked him, I invited him to spend the, the Vasa range retreat here, and he says, oh yes, I'll, I'll do that, I'll have to find time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, 102, you know, it's, uh, but he still had this, <laughs> this kind of a, uh, uh, his body was a hundred and two only, mentally, he, he was ageless. So he, and then the, the uh, subject for contemplation is Gate to, to the Deathless, which is, of course, my, my theme song, really. <laughs> <laughs> Because this has always been uh, um, something that uh, I felt very uh, kind of intuitively, this sense of uh, deathlessness, and and of course uh, the we live in a realm where death is the most obvious power that we all have to face, isn't it? It's, uh, after birth, and there's uh, then, the, the, then, you know, the, what happens between birth and death is uh, all subject to various other conditions of happiness and suffering, success and failure, praise and blame, uh, and so forth. But then the inevitable death is something that we all <clears throat> will experience in the future. And because the uh, the the human tendencies to identify strongly with the physical body as a, as being one's self one's as being you know what what we feel is really mine and then <clears throat> the sense of death is a very strong feeling it's something that seems seems uh, uh, us you know this is definitely going to happen we're all going to die and uh, death is is you know something to uh, Dread, or it's oftentimes looked on as something bad or something uh, depressing, because it it is the unknown. It's what we we haven't experienced yet, so it, it remains the mystery in terms of experience, in terms of physical death. Anyway, it's uh, something we will find out, and we will all definitely experience. But between uh, birth and death is the opportunity for enlightenment. Uh, so that on a Vesaka Puja celebration in the Theravada tradition, you have this, uh, you celebrate the birth, enlightenment, and death of the Lord Buddha. And uh, so Western people who like to be factual and, and historically accurate, they don't believe that the Buddha actually could have been born, he was enlightened and died you know, on the full moon of May. Uh, you know, it's just too, too, uh, sounds too, too neat, too like a, a package deal rather than, a, than an actual uh, human life. 
But that's not the point, is it? It's the fact that that, that now we're experiencing the uh, the the enlightenment potential, say, between birth and death. Now this is this is a reflection, of course, and and of course we we tend to see enlightenment as something that is that is maybe very uh, a remote possibility, and that something that that is not you know that uh, generally most people most people regard as being something very unlikely so <laughs> uh, so that the, this uh, this this is something to to contemplate. What do we mean by enlightenment? And is it is it something that that remote, that difficult, that impossible? The trouble with any any uh, religious tradition is it tends to. Um, uh, Put a a religious uh, the, the religious teachings into into the kind of they're, they're apotheosized they're they're put up among the stars they're raised up on high. So in Thailand you even have uh, monasteries that that put all the religious books in a bookcase. They have a Buddha Rupa and then they have a bookcase with the Tripitaka in it, and uh, nobody reads this Tripitaka but they bow to it. <laughs> Or some, very few would read it, but they bow to it, and they bow to the Buddha image, uh, and they might bow to the bhikkhu sangha, you know, the monk, uh, and thinking this is uh, paying respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So, so religion oftentimes is put into this very high position uh, to where the average person uh, can't relate to it as something uh, that they can actually do or something that 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 uh, uh, is something for themselves. Uh, so that even though we were all born and we know we're all going to die, enlightenment can be seen as as uh, something that maybe the Buddha did. Somebody like the Buddha could get enlightened. Who's who's this sage? Who's a who, who's apotheosis? Is is means that he's way up in the stars now. He's a, He's a, a special being with a with a fantastic history and with uh, special qualities that we none of us would would could possibly claim. We're also informed about the age as the Kali Yuga, uh, the age of destruction. It certainly seems like that in many cases. And then uh, the uh, there's uh, so many ways, so many depressing ways to look at a human life at this time. Uh, that uh, that we uh, sometimes forget or don't appreciate or have never really uh, contemplated or considered the, the opportunity that we have now and as uh, living, breathing uh, human beings at this time. No matter what yuga, yuga, yuga it is or no matter if it's the end of a millennium, end of a century or as far as Buddhism goes, it's the middle of a century. This is 25, 40, 41. It's the middle. But if you get into the Christian, then it's the end of a century. So who's right and who's wrong? Or is this relative or is it absolute or what? But it does, what we can do with it is to reflect upon it. How, how conventions, how words, how teachings, how traditions, uh, symbols and forms and ideas, how they affect our mind. And so this, this uh, deathlessness, this gate to the deathless is, uh, is, a, is a, a symbol that to me uh, had a lot of, I was particularly found interesting because for many people, Buddhism is just a kind of almost a therapeutic uh, 
uh, a form of therapy where you kind of uh, deal with your stuff, as they say. Uh, in Amravati, uh, one, one woman recently criticized us for saying, oh, all you people talk about is dealing with your stuff. <laughs> so. I know this is the common jargon of the age, uh, but the, uh, some, sometimes that's what it seems like. We, you know, what are you doing today? Well, I'm just dealing with my stuff today. <laughs> and for many people, that's probably what they're, they're all they're, that's all they're doing, but. Uh, as far as a, a, say, a religious path, they, they, which takes you to the ultimate, to the perfection of humanity, of being human. And maybe that's too high, maybe that's too, maybe I'm just being too high-minded or, uh, you know, idealistic or unrealistic about life. But, uh, and, and of course, people do throw these kind of, uh, Criticism that me, because a lot of people don't like this emphasis on the deathless. Uh, they, they they find it uncomfortable, or or it it sounds too abstract, too, too nothing that they can can really see has any value because you can't see the deathless. You can't prove it in the way that you can prove the existence of suffering, or you you, you can. Uh, you know, you, a, a conditioned experience we all can relate to very well. That is, any form of pain or suffering or disease, we all have a good idea of what that's about. Or happiness, success, uh, being praised, being prosperous, development, progress. <coughs> uh, we can all uh, relate to these kind of images uh, as being, you know, this. Oh, I want, want to be successful and happy and healthy and 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 that is are the desires uh, of of this realm, this realm that we live in, and then the uh, the the fear of it, everything going wrong, of of being a failure, of being unhappy, of being sick, and having uh, terrible health, of getting cancer, of of losing uh, your loved ones, and your your home, and your job, and so forth. All these are the great fears of, of human society and of human individuals. And of course, religion, religion's function is this pointing at the deathless, you know, and this, to be a religion, you know, it has to, the, it has to be a convention, a tradition whose, whose aim is, who's, who's pointing directly at the deathless. Or, and this is this is a Buddhist way of looking at it, or say God, or uh, eternal life, or whatever, various uh, salvation, uh, liberation, freedom, uh, vimuti, moksha, uh, salvation, all these are words that, that convey that, uh, that ultimate realization that's possible for uh, the human individual. <clears throat> so, this is to be contemplated. Some Buddhists say, well, we don't believe in God and in an eternal soul. And these kind of, because the Buddha deliberately refrained from using terms of that kind. Uh, the Buddha's teachings were based on uh, the, uh, on the experience of suffering and the realization of non-suffering. So the, 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 he brought the religious path into a kind of practical experience that everybody can, can understand because everybody suffers. Everybody has experienced suffering. But deathless or the, the ultimate release or nibbana or these kind of words they 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 stop the mind. We don't we can't figure them out. We would like to. We'd like to say, what is, is there a deathless or what is it then? Do you 
when you die, that means if you're enlightened, your 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 kind of soul kind of merges with the ultimate soul, or something like this. Or uh, Buddha would never talk like that. <laughs> or there's a there's an ordinary self, and then there's a over self. Some people talk like this, but Buddhists we don't talk about over self and little self. Uh, and we don't talk, talk. We talk about self as no self. Uh, so that there's a sense of uh, of trying to describe the the uh, realization of the deathless. Uh, these are various attempts at doing that, merging with God or union with the ultimate or <clears throat> ultimate liberation. Uh, but we don't know what they are. Uh, we can make them sound like they, they sound very good, don't they? Like like going to heaven or union with God or one with the ultimate, things like that. It, it sounds uh, like it might be very, you know, desirable thing to aim for. Uh, but in terms of our own experience, we, we don't really know what it is. We Maybe a heaven state where we everything is is easy and beautiful and pleasant and we we, we're always happy is maybe the best we can create a, a vision of of the afterlife at its best uh, is a, is a kind of heavenly realm like a children's view isn't it? the soda water fountains uh, mountains of ice cream uh, you can stay up as late as you want <laughs> <laughs> And everybody's nice and kind, and you're with God, and He's loving, and and you don't uh, hurt yourself. You don't get measles or chickenpox in heaven. Things like that it must be uh, like a child's vision uh, of. Wouldn't it be nice if everything were nice, if everything were perfect? But in terms of of experience, we don't know. The realm we live in is filled with a lot of pain and frustration. So I remember even as a small child, you know, you fall down and skin your knee and and then you'd feel this pain in the knee and I'd wonder why why do we have to suffer pain? You know, if I were God, I would have I would have created human beings so they wouldn't have any pain. I used to think like that. Why do we have to have pain like like a skin knee or uh Spraining an ankle or breaking an arm or getting the the flu or the measles or the chickenpox. Why do we have to suffer with this stuff? Why can't why couldn't have God created a world where there's no pain and no disease? Because that's what you know would seem like would be the a perfect realm. A per, if you're going to create something, why not create something perfect? Why create something that's basically imperfect? Well, these are the <laughs> the the moral dilemmas uh, and the doubts that arise in in uh, religious minded people. The the Buddha never <clears throat> never used the creation theory, and so he never. And when when the pandits and the the uh, the Brahmins and the Sages and the religious leaders of his time, you know, used to try to corner him. And in, in the scriptures, some of these are quite amusing. They try to corner the Buddha and 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 say, "Okay, is there a god or not a god? And what happens when you die? When the when the enlightened one dies, does his uh, does he merge into something called the deathless, or or what happens uh, to the soul and so forth?" And the Buddha remained silent. And then the then the pandits would say, As he doesn't know, he's, he can't answer the question. <laughs> if he's a Buddha, he certainly must know everything, you know. And so uh, he you know, he certainly would know this if he's a real Buddha, so he's obviously not a Buddha. But in but then silence itself is a, is an answer to that question, isn't it? Because silence is is where we stop. You know, and when 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 you go silent, you stop trying, you stop thinking, you stop struggling. Uh, 
it's it's the stopping of that endless kind of movement of the of the mind that restlessness of thinking and emotion that we we get caught by we get we get pulled into we get carried away with it and that's where we find in our own society now here in in England isn't it so much suffering is around the restless wandering mind the obsessive thoughts the the negativity we have uh, how much we worry about everything how much how many things that we can find to worry about in in a society that's fairly well run that is uh, affluent and yet we can spend our days you know, just worrying about uh, next year or what's going to happen uh, when I do uh, when, when I retire or things like this what's going to happen when uh, when the when the children grow up and, or will will I be will I lose my job and this is a problem that many people worry about now redundancy unemployment <clears throat> so the the mind is very much a mind that that creates problems it's a creative mind we create endlessly we proliferate we we bring out into make things exist that uh, that are not often necessarily skillful or useful or good but habitual uh we we we're caught in the in in the momentum of our habits and and this uh this habitual kind of ang anxiety and worry seem to follow us even into a, a fairly safe uh, family life, uh, society, uh, ec economic uh, and political conditions that are, you know, reasonably safe and stable compared to most countries. And yet we can, the, the, what we produce out of our minds is oftentimes quite negative. We see what's wrong. We see how things can go wrong. How everything that we've, everything we're, we've given importance to, every uh, uh, investment we've made in life can be just taken away from us or suddenly vanish in the thin air. Ajahn Virdama was telling me about coming back from Latvia uh, recently, where he is saying the, the, these people in the Eastern European countries. Like Latvia, they can, they you know, they work hard and under the Soviet system, save lots of money, saved as much money as they could in in these banks, and then suddenly they lose it all. You know, imagine that after working forty years and thinking I'm going to retire now with a good pension, suddenly it's your money's worthless. Just how it can just dissolve into thin air. Forty years of hard work and saving. Uh, and so we recognize that 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 life on this planet in this way is basically like this it's very uncertain uh it's its nature is insecure and so the buddha was pointing to this to this that 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 the conditioned realm is something not to 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 take refuge in not to to use your life only to seek security and happiness in the conditioned world, either through uh, finding somebody, a person you love, and, and getting dependent on them, or, or having lots of money, or political and economic systems, social systems. Uh, all of these things are subject to sudden and immediate change. And so it's, it's uh, either through through war or through economic failure or through catastrophe or natural catastrophe. When there's a terrible tidal wave that hit Papua New Guinea, suddenly just, you know, overwhelmed, I think a thousand people, they, they haven't been able to count all the dead bodies yet, of a tidal wave that just uh, completely demolished uh, part of the uh, part of Papua New Guinea. This was only a couple of days ago. So this uncertainty, this insecurity is 
is the suffering that we that we tend to resist. It's like tell me everything's going to be okay. Say everything is all right. Uh, tell me uh, that that you know we go to the fortune tellers or the astrologists or anything just to hope to get some good prophecy for the future of of prosperity and success and happiness. And like on birthdays and things like this, you say, may you live a long life and be successful and prosperous and happy and healthy for more and more years. And this is, you don't say, uh, may you awaken to the insecurity of this realm. <laughs> that you could die almost any time and any savings you might have might suddenly disappear. <laughs> this is not a way to be make yourself popular in life. <laughs> I think that would be more honest, wouldn't it? <laughs> But yet, in our hearts, we, we long for this, like a long life, which may be, in some cases, a, an aspiration for the ultimate, for the deathless. Because when you think about living a long life in a physical body, uh, it doesn't isn't sound very attractive, especially when you're getting old, to think of having to live well, have 64 more years in increasing decrepit physical body. It doesn't sound like an attractive prospect to me. <clears throat> I think maybe, well, modern medicine will come out with increasing, and you know, you take a pill and suddenly you, your whole, you know, it'll renew everything in your body and you'll suddenly have a young heart, a young liver, a young kidney. Everything will go young again. <laughs> I think what, what if it, what if we reverse the whole process? You find yourself getting younger and younger, and ended up as a baby. <laughs> that would be it. <laughs> I don't think I'd like that. Would you? <laughs> In terms of, say, like Christianity, like when I was Christian, we were told God is uh, here with us all the time. And so then <clears throat> you kept thinking, well, where is he then? You know, I don't see him. And, well, he just, you know, you just have to open yourself to God and, and he'll be there. And so I remember... Uh, when I was young, trying to do this, trying to open myself to God and waiting for something to happen, nothing happened. So, <laughs> because I still saw God as a kind of, you know, something that was going to happen, uh, as, some, as a condition, really, because the word God itself, <clears throat> that way of thinking, because uh, Christianity so anthropomorphizes God that you that you always think of it as a, a, like this patriarchal figure. <clears throat> so in a part of you is it's kind of expecting some kind of patriarchal figure or something to happen that will say, I'm God and I'm with you all the time and, and some statement, you know, or some voice out of inside or outside coming at you, you know, I, I am here, you are safe. And, uh, but not, nothing ever happened like that. So, so then, in uh, so then, one tended to dismiss that possibility as just Christian um, Christian way of talking and kind of, you know, kind of convincing you, trying to convince you to believe. In the Buddhist approach, the the uh, oftentimes the deathless is is something that's overlooked. Uh, it, because it's not given, it's not given a form like God the Father, or it's given some kind of presence as a in in some kind of anthropomorphic form. So it 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 remains like an abstraction because deathlessness sounds like an idea 
rather than a reality. Because everything we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think is, tra is transient and changing. It all ends. Everything ends. So there's this, uh, this continuous beginning and ending going on a, a, as experience through the sense realm, through the conditions of the mind. And so we, we really uh, think of uh, when, we, when we try to contemplate the deathless, the mind goes quite empty. Try to, try to think about the deathless. What, what kind of image? Can you get an image? Maybe a, <clears throat> a big kind of, like the Zen, or this kind of circle <laughs> with one end open. <laughs> About the neatest form, probably. That's just my, my impression. But then silence. Because when you stop thinking, everything goes silent. When the ending of thought, isn't it? When a thought ceases and, the, and you don't start thinking with some, again, the silence, the mind is very silent, just still. <clears throat> You can, uh, we have words like infinity and eternity conveying immeasurable states that, you know, that time uh, or timelessness or distance that, is, that has no boundary, no end to it. And that we can't conceive, it. we call it infinite, but it means that it's just beyond our ability to see any boundary, any limitation. And eternity as uh, like time that goes on forever and never ceases. We think of it in terms of time rather than timelessness. And yet in terms of experience, eternity is, is timeless. And uh, I think Blake had uh, some his, one poem about the, this eternity, you know, as the here and now, this this sense of the eternal, the moment, the eternal moment, the presence now, the here and now, is eternity. Where, uh, before I ever contemplated that word, I kept thinking of eternity as like time that just goes on and on and on and on and on, never ends. So this is where we, we contemplate, you know, we're considering now, just with our language, with our concepts that we use, our thoughts, what, what, what do we really mean by these words? And what are they, what are they signifying? What are they, what are they pointing to? So in, in terms of direct experience in meditation then, Buddhist meditation, what do you do when you're, when you're meditating? Is your, you know, and the formal techniques of Buddhist meditation are around sitting still, usually, and concentrating the mind, opening the mind, uh, putting, uh, being uh, fully aware and awake in the present. So that this, this present, because this present moment is all we ever experience. It's, that's all there ever is for us is the eternal present. Uh, this is this is this is where uh, uh, the birth takes place. Enlightenment and death is in the present. For us now, physical death, say, is in the future, but enlightenment is now. Enlightenment is now. I don't feel enlightened. <laughs> or. Is it, is, is it, when you try to think of it and, and understand it through thought or analysis, you just get tangled up by it. And you just go around and around and, and it, it, there's no point in thinking or defining or trying to imagine it, but in the reality of it, the simple reality of, uh, that we uh, consciously experience through awareness. So that's the gate to the deathless. 
and this, this gate, a gate is, you know, it's the entrance, and and so we, it's like like the human individual, each one of us is at this point, uh, uh, this this gate. We're at this gate. There's death, death, death bound things are here. We're used to that. We're, we're used to all this this death stuff. All our stuff is about death. <laughs> <laughs> and so, all this stuff, we're used to that. And this is the world, the sense of ourself, our personality, our cultural conditioning, our views and opinions, our emotional habits, our prejudices and biases, and our sense of self-importance, or uh, self-hatred, and, and all the rest of it, the whole, uh, the whole range of Condition experience from A to Z is on this side of the gate, and we're we're here. We can we can rec we can we feel at ease within this side because we're used to it. So sometimes you find uh, people just you know absorbing themselves in various obsessive ways of of just uh, you know in. Uh, of heightening experience, or through or through deadening experience, like the drug scene in the past forty years in the West. And it's before when I was um, a youngster, <laughs> uh, there were no drugs. When, when I was in the Navy, I was in the Navy, in 1953 to 1957, and you know, sailors, American sailors, aren't noted for just going to missions and and playing canasta when they go to port <laughs> and so <laughs> so you find <laughs> uh, you know you you're subject to the to quite a lot of temptations and i was on a ship that that was uh you know sailing all over the pacific ocean to uh, the the uh, Japan and the Philippines, uh, Hong Kong, and, and then uh, west coast of the United States to Hawaii and San Francisco, San Diego, and you, and wherever you go, there's always some something that 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 some kind of thing that they're trying to sell you. So in Japan, it was it was brothels. As soon as you got into the port, the taxi drivers were there, and they take you immediately to the brothels. In Hong Kong, it was the tailors. <laughs> In San Diego, it was the Christian missionaries. In San Francisco, it was the homosexuals. <laughs> so, you had, so you had all this, this kind of, these, these things, these specialties that each port provided to, to, uh, to try out or to get, to accept or refuse or whatever, but none of these ports ever, ever tried to, to sell drugs. This was 1953 to 1957. <clears throat> a lot of uh, liquor and drink and things like that, but no drugs. And, and this was, uh, so this is interesting, and uh, then after the 60s, it was always the uh, this drug scene developed. Many young people now probably think probably think of drugs as, as an ongoing problem. But say in the United States, I'm I'm sure it was the same here in the UK. Uh, in the 50s, this wasn't a problem for most people. Or rare, uh, the the uh, the very uh, rare individual would get caught into the drug scene, or if there was one. But now it's a very common problem because this is also a way to, 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 to influence conscious experience. Because when we think in a certain way, when we, when we, uh, when we have a lot of negative imagery, negative thoughts and emotions, and that the drugs are a very quick way to just stop it all, isn't it? To, to change the, the mental quality of experience either to, to dull it out or to heighten uh, experience into making it kind of fantastic or uh, hallucinogenic drugs make, make, make your mind very 
uh, interesting, fantastic. Because the ordinary uh, being, presence here and now, is, is overlooked all the time. We don't, we don't awaken to the present. Very few people really awaken unless they're in a situation that demands like a dangerous physical danger where you, you have to pay attention. When you're driving a car, isn't it? You have to, something in you has to wake up to just know where you are and who's, what the, who's, who's, uh, who's, who's walking where and what cars are coming and where you are and read the signs. So, so, or climbing uh, mountains, glaciers, or, or rock, rock climbing has become popular where you, you, you train yourself to climb up rocky cliffs. Or escarpments, a sheer, sheer kind of cliffs, amazing thing what people can do just to be awake, to feel alive. Because when you're, when you're not awake uh, and, you're not, and your life has no kind of, no, no, no intensity to it of any sort, one easily drifts into depression or despair, one gets bored and, uh, and one just... Uh, can, cannot stand to be that way. So drink and drugs, doing exciting things, endless distractions, are ways of feeding the condition experience to bring ex the, the extremities of experience into consciousness. But that which is neither extreme, neither pleasant or painful, neither beautiful or ugly, neither exciting or boring, or good or bad, is something that sounds so dreary, so so boring, so tedious, that, that we don't even contemplate that this is a, a possibility for us. Now, in the, the Buddha's path, the Buddha encouraged us to really reflect on the conditioned realm as experience, not to, it's not to judge the conditioned realm. We're not going to say all the conditioned realm is just, you know, it's all impermanent and it's suffering and, and just kind of dismiss life in general, uh, the conditioned experiences and sensory experience and, and beauty. We can, I've heard people say beauty is impermanent, you know, just dismiss beauty as don't bother with it, it's impermanent or love, uh, relationships, just dismiss them as, as all in, it's all suffering, all impermanent. <laughs> and uh, that's, not, that's not reflecting, is it? That's taking a stand. Uh, that's, a, that's using uh, this uh, Buddhist teaching to dismiss experience rather than to examine it. You see, so uh, this is where sometimes these, uh, the Vipassana teachings or the, the emphasis on on meditation can be merely an, a kind of conditioning of the mind to just see things in a Buddhist with Buddhist uh, biases, Buddhist images. But when you really examine the Buddhist teaching, that's not what he was teaching. He didn't want that at all. It was just for us to just follow. Buddha said everything is impermanent and all beauty. And all these conditioned things are uh, impermanent. They all are cause, uh, suffering. They all they're all unsatisfactory and dismiss life. But the the uh, the emphasis is on examination, on looking into. So this is where, uh, in say, vipassana training, where you you're looking into experience, you're actually observing. Uh, what you are feeling when it's not judging it's not it's not criticizing anything you're feeling it's not uh, praising or blaming or anything it's just noticing it's like this that anger is like this and greed is like this and it's not saying greed is bad is it? greed feels like this feeling insecure and and is like this. And so you kind of look inward, you feel confused or uncertain, insecure, and you, 
you begin to look at it as it is, as experience, rather than than just uh, seeing it as some kind of personal stuff that you you should be able to process and get rid of eventually. So you're you're really beginning to to awaken the mind to the way things are in the present, to to the many emotional habits we have already that we tend to just dismiss and ignore because they don't because they're, they're, they're maybe we don't like them or we can't be bothered with it or uh, we just resist or, or we're, we're programmed to resist it or to d deny them. So the awakened mind, this waking up, listening, paying attention to the four foundations of mindfulness, which is the, the body. We all have a body, physical body now, so we we start awakening to the experience of, of the body in the presence like this. And so you're looking at your body now in an intuitive way rather than than in a, like a, a vain way where if you look in the mirror and say whether you, how old you are, whether you, you, you look good or not, that's vanity. But, but in terms of, of, uh, of intuition, the body is like, you don't need a mirror. You, you, just, you, don't need to, you can even close your eyes and you can still be aware of the body as experience, as, as feeling as experience, as mental, uh, as the mood of your mind, the state of mind you're in, you can be aware of. It's like this. So that this, these foundations for mindfulness, uh, being bringing into consciousness the way it is, and noting the changingness of it, because when you really are with the condition of the present, it's it, you can't sustain, you can't kind of petrify it into permanent. It's very you know changeable. You know, like just awareness of the body. Try to try to petrify a physical the physical body as experience in the present. It's impossible. I can't do it. Or or feelings of any sort. Pain. Physical pain, which oftentimes seems, you know, like a it's really permanent. But when you really open to this pain, physical pain, and observe it, it's, it's, it's very fluctuating, kind of rhythmic, and up and down, and, and fades out, and intensifies, and it's, it's movement, it's change, or, or mood, state of mind you're in. It can't, you can't hold it, you can't make it kind of fixate it, and and, and hold it for very long because it's just, it's just like it. once you really see it, it, it tends to, you're aware of its changingness. It's kind of uh, the way it breaks up and, and, and doesn't, doesn't have any core or anything that can, you can hold it together except through ignorance. Holding to the idea that I am angry or I am resentful gives it a kind of solidity and a and kind of gives it a, a permanent uh, appearance, which is not the way it really is, but the way we can believe in it, the way we tend to think about it. Contemplate this in, in your own life when you really pay attention to experience in the present. And that paying attention then is, is, is it, you can pay attention to boredom. Well, this sounds boring usually, you know, where, but paying attention to boredom isn't boring. It's, it's, it, we're not used to it. We're, we're used to paying attention to things that are interesting, but things that are boring, we, we get, then we tend to get absorbed into the things that are interesting. You know, we want interesting things, we pay attention to them, and then they, they, they absorb our attention. And then when they get boring, we tend to, to go on to something else. So boredom itself, or suffering, uh, as the first noble truth, is to understand it, to really uh, feel it, know it, 
examine it, inv investigate it. And then that you begin to see the, the recognize the presence, and then it then it ceases, it's absent. So this is why this this gate to the deathless, this image of of uh, the point of intersection between the timeless with time. This this point of say to me this is this means uh, like each one of us is is a conscious human being who's at this point of intersection. We're we're poised on this point where we we look we can look at the death and we can look at the deathless realize the deathless. Now it's up to you to find out what that really is in terms of your own experience. Remember, experience is always now, so it, it's not <clears throat> it, it, it's not tomorrow. <clears throat> it's now. So, so the, the, by investigating the the death bound conditions, the conditioned realm in terms of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self, as we <coughs> lose, as we break that, what that really does, if done properly, is break break down our attachment and our belief. It breaks through all our cultural biases and and attitudes that that have been um, influencing us all our lives. So uh, as you as you begin to look at life in terms of these characteristics, these conditions, as as anicca dukkanata, and then what? Then you you can also at, when you when you uh, let go of the conditioned realm and no longer grasp it or believe in it, then what is left is the unconditioned. You begin to turn to the unconditioned or the deathless. And it, that's called a realization. It's, it's a, a reality that is now, but is generally overlooked, not noticed because of our Habits which are very much formed with attachments to the death bound condition. So, this is the challenge the Buddha gives us to wake up, and not just to sort out our stuff, but to recognize the, the way things really are. Whatever your stuff is, it's not yours and it's impermanent <laughs> and it's. Uh, you know, and it's naturally unsatisfactory, so it's not your fault. You know, not, don't don't feel bad because you're not perfect, or you haven't got it all together, and you're not. <laughs> you know, you, maybe you've had many disappointments. Uh, maybe much of your experience of life has been disappointing, despairing, or hardships, or. Maybe you've had to suffer unfair treatment and lack of recognition and love and appreciation. Uh, and well, they, these are possible uh, uh, human experience, but these are not obstructions to enlightenment. Now, this, 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 the, whatever karmic load you've had to bear, it's not a matter of, of it, of uh, you know, it having to be a certain way. But whatever way it is, you investigate it. In terms of, of instead of seeing it in a highly personal way, see it in terms of the way it is or the Dhamma. All conditions are impermanent. And then you begin to, oh, that awakened state is like it, 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 you begin to trust it and you, 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 you recognize, realize the silence of the mind, the, the pure uh, state of being. I remember we, we keep this vinaya, this monastic discipline, very strictly uh, in the t kind of uh, monastery I lived in in, no in northeast Thailand. they very strict on this discipline. And they talk about purity in vinaya. So I remember trying to keep all these rules as strictly as possible. Oftentimes it meant, you know, taking them to the most extreme interpretation, uh, uh, you know, the, Make sure that you, your 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 purity in vinaya is is sustainable, and so you you know you can get really caught up into 
into this, uh, into keeping all these rules, doing all these things right, right, in the right way, and then never feeling pure. <laughs> you kept saying, you kept saying, well, I'm, you know, maybe there's some something I'm not really facing yet. There's endless doubt coming into the mind. Uh, you know, on the level of maybe, you know, I've got to be more strict, or I've got to be, uh, I'm not pure enough, and I've got to, uh, you know, why, why is it all, after all these years I'm not pure, really pure enough? And then I began to recognize that, that, that that's not where purity is, 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 is in keeping the rules. So I began to contemplate, what is purity as experience? Is, am I, it, the Buddha said, you know, the, the, the conditioned realm is not self. So, so if I think I'm pure or impure, that's a, that's a sense of self, both holding to the sense of I'm pure or I'm impure. So then, just by recognizing that, the sense of purity is aligned with me as a person, or impurity, or purity, it's the same thing, the same problem. And then as your mind stops trying to become or create uh, an idea of purity, or becoming pure, you, you awaken to what is really pure, which is natural to to each one of us. Purity is now. It's not something that you don't have. Even if you've been living the most disreputable life, you're still basically pure. Uh, and this purity cannot be made impure by anything you do or say or think. Do you believe me? <laughs> So, contemplate this in, in the, in, as you, you know, in terms of this purity then, but it's not personal, it's not like I'm pure as a person, because as a person there's a lot of impurities. Personality is basically impure, it's imperfect. As nobody's personality is, a pure, is, is pure. No matter how good you are, you're still not pure. <laughs> so, so then purity then is, is something is something else. It's not goodness, being good, but it's it's a natural state that we that we forget, that we we separate ourselves from through ignorance. Even though it, we're not really separate, that forgetting it all the time, getting caught up, being fully bound into the conditions of being somebody, being a personality, being a, uh, the body you have, or, or becoming whatever, or uh, whatever views you have about yourself, good or bad, that whole kind of thought, thought that those, those kind of thoughts and perceptions, well, if you just get caught into that, then it is an endless task. There's no way you can purify all that. Because those conditions are basically dukkha. They're, they're all dukkha and they're all anatta. But this is, you have to, you're using these concepts to, to look at things, to, to uh, reflect on them. So then the purity is, is realizing when, through letting go of them. You, be, you realize the true nature of being is pure. And that it's, uh, that, and you remember it because it's like it's something. Tr it, it resonates in your heart. This is this is true. This isn't just me trying to convince myself of anything. Uh, it's it's like they they say going home. It's your real home where you 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 don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to become anything. You don't have to be anybody for anything for anybody. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, in, in in worldly terms, you know, the world suddenly is no longer what you're you're living for. You're no longer held and bound into those worldly attitudes. So you're liberated from the world. It doesn't mean you you've rejected the world. You're, the world no longer deludes, no longer 
uh, is your refuge or the place that you're attached to. And so then you begin to appreciate your own humanity and the, and the opportunity that we have as human beings for this realization and this liberation. Salvation, maybe. Because uh, you talk to Christian monks who meditate, and it's not that, you know, they're doing the same thing, actually. And how, but they tend to have their own, you know, Christian terminology. But we're getting beyond the terms, isn't that The terminologies aren't so important anymore because it's the experience, the reality of it. So I remember one time when Ajahn Chah was in, in, in England, the second time, and we, we were making this film uh, called The Buddha Comes to Sussex uh, for, the, for the BBC. And um, we went to this uh, Anglican monastery somewhere in Sussex uh, or some kind of theological school or someplace anyway, uh, Church of England, and the the priests came out, and they were all kind of excited to have us there. And and so one vicar, one priest said, uh, uh, "Ask Ajahn Chah if there's a Buddhist ultimate truth and a Christian ultimate truth." So I uh, I asked Ajahn Chah, and he said, Ajahn Chah looks at me and he says, "How can there be two ultimate truths?" <laughs> 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 ultimate truth is ultimate, you know. <laughs> Not two. No, the, the, the <laughs> well, this, this is what the the aim is: is to realize that ultimate truth, you see, which is is now, and and which is so present that we don't notice, like a fish in the water, isn't it? Or you know, so so here, so much now, that purity is never separate, never lost, but we don't notice it. So we, we look for, for something else, you know, that's further, further away that we can, you know, we can see or, or conceive of. So this is where the, the emphasis on meditation is always the here and now, the, uh, the awakened state here and now, and learning to to really uh, trust in that. It's something that, that each one of us has to trust in ourselves. It's not it, because, uh, you, you know, you have to trust yourself in the, to be awake. And it's not something that you, that is difficult, but it's a matter of, of beginning to, to trust in it, but to, to really uh, do it. And, and trust in the sense of just attentive awareness. Just a, a kind of listening state. It's not an absorbed state into a refined sense of tranquility. It's just, just this much. Silence. Right now, the mind stops. The thinking mind. It's that much. And as you begin to, to realize that more and more, the emptiness of the mind, the silence of the mind, then you, then it be, then it becomes clear and clear as a real refuge, because that refuge is a refuge. It's something you can always trust in. It will always, you know, whatever's happening to you in life, uh, it's a it's something that you can always trust. It's a refuge that will carry you through difficult times, disappointments and loss and 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 totally impossible situations <laughs> if you if you trust it and it, and it's something that like it a, 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 that you have to trust yourself to do it nobody can make you do it it's not something that, that some some teacher or enlightened master can can get you to do so it's 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 not given to you by some it's your the natural state of your of your true being so it's a matter of remembering, reminding yourself, 
and trusting yourself to do it. So I offer this as a reflection, a gate to the deathless. Uh, our, the gates of deaths are open. Aparuta de Sangamatasa Tawara. This is the deathless realm, Amravati. We've got two nice gates out there. <laughs> Sometimes we close them though. <laughs> so don't depend on this, the deathless here. But <laughs> <laughs> find it in yourself. <laughs> There's only symbol, symbolic deathless. The, the, um, then the second part, ye soda one ta bamunjan tu satang. Ye soda one ta. Soda one ta is one who listens, who's, who's attentive right now. Those who hear, those who are hearing now, who are awake right now, Trust in this, you know. Bamunjan tu satang. Satang is faith. I have faith. And, and Bamunjan tu is kind of rest or relax into this faith. Give yourself to this and trust in this, uh, in that pure state of just attentive awareness in the present. And, and no matter how many times you get carried away, you can always do it, start right now. It's not like you're ever really going to fail. Don't, if you start thinking of yourself as a success or a failure, don't believe it in terms of success or failure. It's not a worldly thing. So, so you, you lose it, get carried away, but then you remember. That, that point of, of remembering this is, is what you trust in. I notice like in, it makes things very clear also in terms of of experience, like it, you know, like like the the life we live, where you you have to deal with maybe a lot of emotional stress, disappointing things, and and unpleasant uh, things that happen to us, or unfair things, or things like you know, really unwanted and unfair experiences. And I can see my mind, you know, goes. I've had enough of this. This is this is this is uh, this is um, more than I can bear. And then I contemplate, and this that is not the path following that kind of thought. <laughs> but this is this, this sense of trust and purity in the present. It's, it's purity. Don't believe me, but when you begin to realize it more, it is it has no no color, no. It, it, it's 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 very strong and very powerful and very natural uh, and and it and it has and it, it's pure it's intelligent it's, it's pure intelligent it's not a purity that's kind of a, a blank uh, uh, or dull it's, it's bright it's pure it's intelligent so this is this is the 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 why the human Human birth is regarded so highly in in the Buddhist world. In the human birth is considered the best birth. If you're going to be born, be born as a human. I used to question that a lot. I think, to me, for a lot of my life, I think it's a curse being born as a human. I think being born as one of these these kind of nice pedigree dogs that <laughs> that mm, upper class ladies hold on their lap. <laughs> Take you for little, nice walks on Hampstead Heath. You know. <laughs> but that might be a nice birth for a while, but uh, pedigree dogs uh, suffer a lot too. They get, you know, they go crazy sometimes. <laughs> if they don't get their, their properly prepared shrimp at the right hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I offer this as a reflection for this afternoon. And there's tea, as you can see, over on the server, and then in uh, 20 minutes or so, I'll ring the bell, and 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 those of you who wish to can come back to uh, for further discussion. <laughs>